Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. So today I have Maria Thompson joining me on the Focus on Why podcast and Maria is a property developer from the Highlands. Welcome. Thank you very much, Amy. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I'm very excited to hear all about your why, all about what it is you do and why you do it. So why don't we just crack on and just explain to the audience what it is you do? Uh, I am a principally a commercial to residential developer in Edinburgh, although my last three developments uh, purchases have been in the Highlands. So in Edinburgh, I buy listed buildings, offices, I get planning permission, and then I convert them into beautiful homes. The advantage that I have, although my architect hates it, he says the problem with Edinburgh is it wasn't bombed during the war. So we have these quirky buildings um, that are difficult to develop and require traditional skills, but they make beautiful homes. That sounds fantastic. So what is it that you uh, were doing before that led you into this current development? Well, I've done so many things. Uh, my mother used to follow me around at parties and say, it's all the truth because I have done a wide variety of things. Um, from being a commercial litigator to running an estate agency to being a hypnotherapist and actually at one point even a stage hypnotist. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. And then uh, we have a very big festival business. We um, had one of the first coffee businesses in Britain and we now are in property. I have serviced accommodation and my main focuses commercial to residential so a lady who wears many hats exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean I just wanted to let's pick through some of those um starting with why you went into litigation well I suppose I'm naturally argumentative I like to solve problems I like to solve problems and as a commercial litigator I never saw anything that went smoothly. Nothing came onto my desk until there was a problem and there was a fight. So the way that this influences my life is that um, my life in property at the moment is that when people are looking to spend vast sums on JB agreements, what I, if I'm given my choice, then I prefer to take a simple agreement, sit down with the person, and look on it like a prenuptial marriage agreement. And people have to understand that no matter how expensive or how comprehensive your JV agreement is, it's worth nothing until you've spent even more money going to court on it. So it's interesting that you you always come from the perspective of liking challenges, of, of, of thriving on those challenges, because a lot of people look for that easy route, easy life, but you you did the opposite. Yes. I, I saw a great quote once where the only thing that's wrong is you expect it to be easy. You know, this this lockdown is, it, it might be, it's, it's a different circumstances, but that is life. Life is, is actually always challenges and you have to be happy just riding the wave. So how was it sort of going into litigation and then moving into other areas that you, you went into? I mean, was it an easy transition or why, why did you have set up the festival business and the, and the coffee business? I believe, uh, I believe that success leaves clues. So I believe that actually your traits can make you successful in anything. But the reason why I changed from being a commercial litigator, which is normally a lifelong career, was my husband, um, he had had testicular cancer before we married. And then when we had um, three children at that point, 
he lost the sight in his eye and he phoned me from his office and said, I can't see. So I said, well, don't you dare come home unless, until you've been to a doctor's. So he went to an optician's and the optician noticed that his optic nerve had hemorrhaged, which is very common in the over 80s. But at his age, which was 30, I think there was like three people in the world that it had happened to. So I have a passion about the mind-body link and I, I thought our life was too stressful. And it was almost as if I even believe in the simplistic metaphors of he was blinding himself to see. So what I decided to do was that we would take our children out of school and we would travel the world looking for another business. So we ended up in Los Angeles. And because I was looking for opportunities, lots of opportunities presented themselves to me, including actually being approached by a Hollywood agent for my children <laughs> to star in movies. Um, but then we ended up on the, the very quiet Hawaiian island of Kauai. When we were in LA, we had noticed Starbucks. And Starbucks was not in Britain at this time. And Gordon sat down and sort of almost wrote on a napkin the, the process of the drive through And then when we lived in Kauai, there was a place that we used to go to, which was called Haleo Java, which was House of Coffee. But they sold pizza as well. And it was our favorite place. So that's where the, um, the coffee and pizza came. So that was, yeah, so that's where you, you set up the two businesses when you returned to the UK in, in the festival business and then also the coffee business. Well, the festival business started first and uh, obviously because we ended our lives we, and we'd spent a lot of money. Um, Hawaii is not a cheap place to go to live. So we didn't have a lot of money. We had to be resourceful. So the police in Edinburgh were selling their, their old police boxes, their Doctor Who TARDISes. So we got them and they were in terrible positions. So the whole of Edinburgh could not understand why you pay a lot of money for a coffee. It was unheard of. And the way that police put, you know, they were in terrible housing estates. So what we had to do was we had to take these police boxes and put them in good locations. So that was a, a big planning fight, uh, which we won. And we eventually got, um, got them placed in George Street, Rose Street, and three in George Square, which is a World Heritage Site. So it really honed our skills with regard to planning. So I can see that the sort of the interest in property starting to form already. Yes, yes. Well, in when I been working as a lawyer I was actually in charge of an office in the latter stages that had an estate agency and I really liked the estate agents actually I liked the people who were in property because um, when you're a commercial litigator it's not necessarily a, a friendly environment because it's very adversarial so I liked the property I liked the whole transformation and Edinburgh as I said has very uh, beautiful property. Um, the estate agents that were there are now the senior valuers in the um, estate agents in Edinburgh. But that's where I first got my uh, business love of, of property. So I'm assuming that everything was okay with your husband. He was all right after your trip of yes. travels. Yes, he was. That he was actually put into hospital and for four days they thought it was a brain tumour because of his um, previous history. But in fact, it was just stress that had caused his optic nerve to hemorrhage. And wow. now he's fine. Perfect. He's fine. Good, good to hear. So how do you think living with those sort of near-death experiences or, or the threats on his life affected what you then went on to do or have gone on to do since? I take very fast action and uh, I, I just act so fast. So I was on a Zoom meeting last Monday and one of the panellists, foolishly, 
<laughs> put up his contact details. And I thought, I need your help. And I took a screenshot and I phoned him. And his reply to me was, I am really impressed by your fast action, which I took as a huge compliment. And I think if you want to get anywhere, you have to act fast. So you, you st- so let's just go back. So you, you've come back to the UK or to Scotland and you're, you're, you've got your businesses set up. Why were you doing that? What was important for you to have these different incomes from the coffee and the festival business? It's security, really. You, you need... Uh, the thing is that the festival business is seasonal. So you can make a lot of money, but only in four months. And, you know, you've got to act fast because no matter how tired you are, the business is not going to be there tomorrow. So you have to take action in that moment. And it really teaches you to strike while the iron is hot. Whereas the, our coffee business was principally located around the university. So as that became quiet, the festival business took off. So at that point, we had a, a year-round levels of income. And you were at home with the children at this time? or? Well, our children actually, uh, because as I say, we spent all our money, our children have always worked with us. So what another thing I did actually was <laughs> I, um, I started making muffins. So I, I like to look out and ask people who know more than I do. So I had a great friend called Kailash and Kailash was a computer whiz kid. But the thing that she loved to do was just study business. She loved to study startups. And again, this is years ago. So she was Canadian. She told me about Tim Hortons. I'd never heard of it. And she said, yeah, you can make muffins. So I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I can make coffee and muffins. And then being me, I analyze everything to death. I take everything to a very high standard. So back in the day that I was making muffins, I used apple puree, I made vegan muffins. So then lots of people came asking me for my muffins. <laughs> and I used to sell them in, um, yeah, I had about 37 different outlets that I used to sell them to. So what I started at, as a kitchen table, then I ended up having an organic bakery at a miserable time of my life. <laughs> I don't know any corporate litigator who had a muffin business on the side. <laughs> I know. But as I say, if you, have, if you have certain work ethics, you can't fail. Now, I always say that there will be people who will be better than me, but I will be up there because I will work really hard. And I'll ask people who know. Working in all these different industries and then finding property. And property is now something that you're really passionate about. How did yeah. you how did you get started in your property business? Well, I'd always, I'd always, I, I bought my first flat when I was really young. I bought my first flat actually when I was a trainee solicitor, and then I renovated it and I sold it within three months for almost double the price. And then I, I you know, I bought a, a bigger flat and I had people coming in, and then I would look for. I would look for things with problems like, um, you know, pieces of land that, that had, had problems with their title. Then I would, I would buy that, then I would solve it, then I would sell it. I was also drawn to commercial, to residential, although I didn't know what it was. So when I came up to the Highlands, I needed a big house. So there was a butcher shop <laughs> with a, a double upper plant above it. And so I got planning permission to convert that into a townhouse. So people used, but we had to move into it. And and I got the kids to help. They also helped in the muffin business. They used to wrap all the muffins. (laughs) And then in the, when we moved up at first, they were supposed to start at the local school and I didn't understand village life and I kept them off school to help me renovate. So they were renovating the house and every day they were saying, where are these children? Because everybody knows your business in a Highland village. I guess having travelled, you weren't that concerned. You were sort of homeschooling in that sense. 
So that's actually a message I would like to say to people who are homeschooling their children now. My daughter went to 11 different schools. She got into Glasgow University to study maths. My son, he went to about the same, um, including a Steiner school, actually. He's, he's stud he studied maths at Edinburgh. The other one, he, uh, he didn't learn to read or write till he was seven. And, but he was a great finger knitter because he went to Steiner's. <laughs> and he works for Deloitte. And then the youngest one, he went straight through the um, state system and the Highland School was supposed to be failing. And he got, nobody in Scotland could have got higher grades than him. There you go. Because they go to school to be educated, to, to socialise, but they get educated at home. And it's the parents' expectations of them that, that matter, in my opinion. So what were you doing to educate them? What was it that you were, were you teaching them to read or...? or I did actually teach, I taught my two oldest to read when they were very young. And then I actually, I embraced the Steiner ethos. And so, you know, my son, he, as I say, he didn't learn to read till he was seven. And that was actually in a state school that he learned. And what happened, well, it was a state school that had the full um, number of children in the class with split teachers. And in one, in less than one year, he excelled to the year above. So it's just, it, it's not hard actually. It's just a system, but it's it's not anything to worry over. And and there's lots more that they have to have. But your expectations, and not in a hard way. When I said to my children, you have to get into university. You don't have to go, but you have to get in because I feel that. You can never allow someone to belittle you because you haven't been able to achieve what they've achieved. Um, it must be choice. I think that's a great, great lesson to learn is, is to have that choice, to have the freedom of choice in whatever you do and, and not feel that you have to follow any particular set route. And the traditional route, as we know, is, is not so, well, it, it's, it's broken. It, the, the traditional route is broken and, and we are now looking for alternative ways of of finding resources in terms of our education and looking at different ways of how to educate ourselves and and then taking that into being more entrepreneurial into thinking how can I have security I think that was a word I picked up on you saying earlier you were looking for security why was that important for you I think well, I mean, I do believe that security is an illusion. However, it's an illusion that is a basic human need. And we all like and prosper, actually, I, in the illusion of security. Although maybe the exact opposite is true. We, we prosper when we are insecure because we take action. I think that's fair to say for you, for you in your case, because you certainly take action when you're sort of pushed into a corner or, or exposed to unnecessary risk or or have things that you're not expecting happen to you. Yes, that's right. Um, so with the start of this lockdown, I was settling a uh, Slateford house. I'd got planning permission on it. For, I'd gone looking for nine, I got eight. I had my equity set up, but I could not uh, complete because my senior debt pooled their funding as, as they did all across the board. So this last time, I've had to negotiate a new date of entry, which will be the 30th of April. And in the meantime, I've had to pick up extra equity so we've been very very lucky that people have had faith and have invested but I was still 100,000 short so on Friday the the money came in via home for a, a loan from Hong Kong that's given me more than enough money to complete but in the meantime what I did was I tried to um, restructure the purchase so everyone has to go on to bridging at the moment, but I do have development finance lined up. So I've got actually development, I've got bridging at the same price as uh, development finance, which is 
pretty incredible at this at this time. So everything's fine. However, I would prefer to set it. But what we did actually was was we we were looking and we were facing a bleak prospect, which was losing um, Slateford House. And the knock on effect of that would have been that on another development I have, I'm moving on to development finance, but I have to have a really healthy bank account, which means I needed to get Slateford House to pull the 40,000 out that I've invested. So when we were on that same Zoom meeting that I referred to, there was a chat about, I think you were on it too, uh, there was chat about if you see bargains, you'll see them coming out of auctions. Mm. So last Monday, uh, after the Zoom meeting, uh, my husband looked at a development that we'd been looking at for a while, and he put in an offer. So it was offers over 125,000, and he put in an offer of 76 and a half, and we got it. And the thing about this is it's about knowing your area. So although it's the Highlands, it's actually in, it's got lapse planning permission for 13 three-bedroom houses. It's next to a town called Bewley where property is very expensive. But more than that, it's on the North Coast 500, which is one of the hottest tourist routes in Britain. And it's on it both ways. So in the Highlands, my strategy is to hold. So... And I saw that, I saw the image of it on social media and I was like, I want to move there right now. I, lo I love it. It's stunning. So well done on that one. My goodness. Yeah, I think it is about opportunities, looking for the opportunities, understanding that when things are tough, that actually that, you know, in these times you can also see different things happening and people react in different ways. And, and you are definitely looking to push through this. It's important for you to persevere and continue with what you're doing and seek alternative strategies to make things happen for you. Yeah. Where do you think you got that sort of mindset from? Where did I get that mindset from? It's funny, but it's always so much a part of you. Uh, as I am... Um, building a big firm and my pipeline is all coming together now so I need to put that in place uh, I need to put systems in place so back when I was a partner in a law firm our senior partner he wanted to become a professor so he made us do all these things so we were sent on an outdoor training event that used Myers-Briggs type indicators I didn't want to go and actually it was the most transformative thing of my life. It taught me to appreciate myself, my strengths and my weaknesses, or uh, not weaknesses, limitations, limitations. And more importantly, it taught me to appreciate other people's strengths and limitations. So my personality type is an ENTJ. And so everything about that explains why I do what I do, which you know, seems, you know, impressive to other people. However, it is only my nature. My nature is to go out and sort of conquer things. <laughs> but, you know, I need to put things in place. It's the only way I can function. I feel happy doing that. They talk about it that with our children and with our employees, we have a Pygmalion project. We want to make them into an image that is like ourselves. But the quote that I love about that is, if you take the teeth from a tiger, you don't get a tiger, you get a toothless tabby cat. And I think that when we're in the wrong position in life, we are, we're, we're toothless tigers, toothless tigers. And, uh, and that's no good for, for anyone. And it's no good for any business. So I like to work to my strengths and shore up my limitations. And that's why I continue to work. That's why I seek out problems. And an ENTJ loves a multifaceted plan. And then outsourcing and leveraging your limitations to others. Exactly. So today I'm taking on board someone who's called an ISFJ, which is the defender. Now, you would never think when you, you met this woman, that she was at all introverted. She's very sociable, very loving, very kind, 
but but she's she's loud she's a big personality not at all what you expect from an introvert but what interests me was she loves to simplify things so her overriding need is to simplify things so you can see the beauty of it for me she's very clever she can look at every process that I've got and she can simplify it down so that I can get my virtual assistants in the Philippines to do it but she doesn't want she, I could put I could not put her anywhere near IT and she also prefers to be contacted by text but as I prefer to talk, but I have to respect. She might not even be aware that she likes to, to be contacted by text. It's just something that psychologists have noted about this personality type. So again, being me, I delve into it and everything in great detail. To be able to communicate with someone in a method that they prefer, you know, you have to be on to a winner. It's really important. And it's not just the uh, communication is everything. It really is. And, and to understand how best to communicate to different people will build fantastic relationships. And I think it's something you, you've mentioned before that you, you're very good at building relationships and the people that you're working with, you've known them for a very long time through different areas of your business. Yes, it's funny, actually, because when they, when they look at management styles, there's the patriarchal patriarchal style whereas mine is a uh, matriarchal i look on everyone as family and i i like to nurture and scold them as i would my children encourage them i want to see all of them do well i want to see all of us do well and that nurturing sort of understanding where did that come from where was that need of being a, a nurturer well it's quite funny actually it's not funny actually you know it's actually Okay, uh, you can see I feel uncomfortable. Okay, well, when I was little, I had um, I had an aunt who was mentally ill, and um, I was put out to look after her. So that was difficult. I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it. But so you had some strategies to look after her that you felt I did. But the thing is that again, I'm a very practical person. I had to. I was very young. I had to separate out emotions and logic. And actually, to be fair, to be fair, uh, although I was young, you are born, you are born this personality type. So the rest of the people in my family who are obviously more nurturing than me, it would have been devastating to them because they're not equi equipped. I was, I was born equipped to cope with it. And I only see the, the good in it. Only see the good in it. Only see the strength in it. When I was little, um, my nickname was Pollyanna. You know, and I said to my mother, that is a syndrome. You know, I am Pollyanna. I look, I look for the good. I look, I just look for the good. That's not to say that I do not foresee challenges. And as I say, when, back in 2017, what's happened now with COVID and the lockdown, in very personal terms, it's the loss of income. So back in 2017, I was projecting forward to a time when I could see a loss of my personal income because you know, a limitation is I'm not good at the festival business. You know, I can I can run the operations, but I I find it um, very difficult actually being in a in a, a field. Not because of camping or anything like that. It's just the chaos. I don't like chaos. I like order. <laughs> so it was very good for me. And the systems that I set up all those time ago have actually are just about. They were just about to set us up and then the lockdown happened, but they set us up enough that's enabling us to thrive. And so important, again, we go back to that security of you sort of foreseeing the, the potential pains that you might, might have experienced. Yes, 
Well, again, I'd go back. I do think that that is part of my personality, that I will look forward and I will foresee difficulties and I will, I do like to put them in place. It's why in the present day, in the present hour, I don't like to be mired in details because it stops me seeing the bigger picture. So, you know, most of us are aware of the different types. When I see myself I, at my best, I'm standing on top of a mountain and I'm looking down. Um, I'm looking down on troops <laughs> and I'm pushing people into place. And when I am overwhelmed, then I am down in the trenches. And the first thing I have to do is get out of there. And I think it is just so important for every person to know themselves. And, and with the, all the tools that are out there, it's very possible for us. And I think perhaps with the, the rise in uh, you know, mental illness, as I say, which I've had first-hand knowledge of it through family member, I think maybe if people knew themselves and if their parents and their co-workers understood them, then we would be able to put them into places where they would flourish. And what would you recommend people did to, to find that position of thriving? What Any particular tools that you've found very useful? Well, again... You know, to look at my my personality type, it's bossy, and but it's for the good of all. So really, when I work with people, something that I insist on, and it's very difficult. If I could make everyone do it, I would, and they would wear a name badge with just their tongue. So really, anyone who's going to work with me, I ask them to do a free Myers Briggs type indicator test, and it's actually the one that I like. It's called the Sixteen Personalities. And then they just tell me who they are, and then I can understand. But it, when I first ask people to do this, it sounds like I'm snoop. I'm not snooping on them. I tell them about me because they have to understand my limitations. So my limitations are that I can be so focused that I can come across as curtain root. And I would be horrified at the thought of hurting people. But sometimes the effort it takes, and I've worked for decades on it, so I'm much, much better, much better than I used to be. But being an extrovert, then the first thing that's in my head, it's like, who said that? And then, you know, my mother used to say, you know, I have to take her twice the second time to apologise. <laughs> because I would say, something out of context so it's clear to say that mindset has been a great tool for you and having that and then building the property now is something that's really important to you why is it your passion mindset and property are my passion because I actually do not believe that you can be successful in property unless you have the correct mindset and it I find it it extremely sad when I see people who have spent fortunes on property education and I'm not blaming the property education but they, they just haven't been the right they, they don't take action and perhaps if they you know understood themselves they would understand that it's not the next course that they need to go on but perhaps actually they need to JV with someone who is more impulsive, you know, faster to take action. They would look at themselves and say, okay, this is my limitation. It's not any of the courses. Who do I need so that together I'm bringing something huge to the table, which is not money. So the people who I'm bringing on board, what they're bringing to my table is a love of detail. You know, and it's all in the detail. So they're bringing something huge to my table. And I believe that everyone has something in their personality out with their experience that is vital. Uh, it's the missing piece of the jigsaw to someone else out there. 
I think that's a great message for anybody out there. And I mean, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing all of this. It's I think there's going to be people who are going to be listening to this and go, oh, I get it, I get it. I, I, that, I'm a commander also, or I, you know, I, or I'm one of those troops. That either way, they know where they they are and how they fit into the greater jigsaw of life. And I think that's been a really um, important message that you you shared with us. Is there anything else, Maria, that you'd like to say to people right now? Well. I've had a very, I have a very happy marriage. We've been married for 33 years. I have, in spite of being told that we would never have children, I have four beautiful adults that I like. And life is short. You know, just this week I heard of, you know, an unexpected death of a 24 year old, not through COVID, an, an accident. Uh, someone who was going to invest with us in, um, in Slatebridge House, he died. You know, so the thing is that life is short. Take action, action, learn while you're moving. You know, you've got to get momentum. Everybody makes mistakes, but the biggest mistake is standing still or worse, standing on one leg, waiting to go forward. So take action. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson, and if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star iTunes review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, and become a member of the inspiring, uplifting, and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.